should be on. I'll try to speak up and let me let me know if you can't hear me. So credit cards were first envisioned in 1888 um, by Edward Bellamy in his novel Looking Backward. I don't know if you want to thank him for that or not. But there were other uh, inventions also that were sort of envisioned by science fiction. So in a series of magazine articles in 1911, of radar and solar cells were, were predicted. Uh, in Fahrenheit 451, Ray Bradbury uh, talked about uh, earphones that could go in the ears or earbuds, mm -hmm. and also flat screen TVs. And of course, we can't forget Star Trek. So Star Trek uh, showed us uh, cell phones and iPads, unfortunately for Apple, because they had trouble with their getting their patents because of the iPad, uh, iPad-like device that was shown in, in Star Trek. So these are all technology-type uh, inventions, but um, it also applies to medicine. So you may or may not be familiar with these folks. <laughs> so Wolverine, in addition to his fancy claws, um, actually has a great capacity for repair. So he, if he gets injured in his fights and battles for good, uh, they can get repaired very quickly. And of course, vampires, whether you think of old stories or new stories of vampires, they have quite a capacity for uh, tissue repair. And of course, no one says it better than uh, Johnny Depp. In his recent movie, Transcendence, he uh, made predictions of the future, potentially shaping the future, um, looking at repair of skin and even eye defects. We've made a breakthrough with the nanotechnology. We can rebuild any material faster than before. Synthetic stem cells, tissue regeneration, and medical applications are now the us. So science fiction is not, the science fiction writers are not only writing about um, these predictions, these bold predictions, they're also taking a role in shaping uh, some of the discovery and innovation that's happening. But in the case of regeneration, this concept has been around for even longer. So Prometheus is uh, sort of the poster child for regenerative medicine. And Prometheus was punished by Zeus for having given fire to the humans. And his punishment was to have uh, to be tied to a rock, so he was chained to this rock, this island, and a bird came and plucked out his liver every day. I sort of wonder if they knew that the liver has a great capacity for regeneration, <laughs> and uh, maybe they should have just had a liver, had the bird pick out his uh, cartilage one time, and hand <laughs> repair, and then walk around the island for, for the rest of eternity. But anyway, um, this concept of regeneration has been around for a while, and I'm going to talk about it at the end. So I want to point out Ralph Waldo Emerson's notes that meanings, uh, the range of meanings and perpetual pertinence, the story of Prometheus. So we're going to finish with that. Now there are actually cases in nature of incredible regeneration capacity. So this cute little creature here is an axolot from the family of salamanders. And these animals are quite impressive. You can cut off their tail, you can cut off an arm, you can cut off a leg, and they can regrow. So why can't we do that? Well, this, this has been of interest for engineers, and in the mid-1990s, um, this is an article by um, on Bob Lander's work in Time magazine, magazine in the area of tissue engineering. So this is the famous picture of the ear on the back of the mouse. And uh, this, how is this accomplished? Well, they took a, a bimaterial scaffold, and seeded hundreds of millions of cells on that scaffold in order to grow that, uh, grow that ear. Now, it's a little bit hard to translate. It hasn't reached clinical uh, practice very much, but your ear is actually made of cartilage, that tissue that can't repair. And uh, cartilage is found in other places that probably might mean a lot to some people. Uh, so cartilage lines the surface of your knees, uh, the, the, the bones, and uh, lines the surface so you get a low friction, uh, easy movement in your joints, and uh, you can run and move without too much pain. And unfortunately, its loss leads to, lots, leads to a lot of challenge, challenges, particularly for athletes. So using the paradigm of tissue engineering, we can take uh, biomaterials, and my laboratory has worked in particular on hydrogels. Um, this is a hydrogel that's embedded with nanofibers, and there are many formulations that we can use. And we can essentially entrap cells in these materials. So the cells here are um, stained with the fluorescent dye, so you can see them. So the green cells are alive. And our goal was to figure out what is the right environment to make those cells happy and want to produce new tissue. So we went to look for some places that might be able to help us. And um, actually, human development is an incredible place where we can learn um, about how we can potentially create the 
right environment to grow tissues. So we've learned a lot from human development. So this picture here is where we get embryonic stem cells, but even understanding how the cells move around, proliferate, and uh, can make all the different tissues in the body has been very helpful. And we're trying to connect those, um, those cues during development into the biomaterials to induce regeneration. Now how do we do that? There's one word that's become popular nowadays, and it's called convergence. And it means, essentially, people from different disciplines working together. And that's been a theme for a while. So we can create environments to make cartilage grow in a dish, but how can we actually impact people? So in order to address that, we put the polymer chemist and the surgeon together. So polymer chemist, this is Dongyan Wang, but we've had many polymer chemists um, after. He was the very first fellow in the laboratory. So having him work with the surgeons was the first element of convergence. The second here is that I have a plastic surgeon and an orthopedic surgeon operating together. And not only are they operating together, they're operating together on a goat. And this was required for us to actually go into the clinic. So our first clinical trial experience was for cartilage repair. And what we did was a little mini incision and you clean up your cartilage defect. This is one of our patient defects, one of the early ones. And then we put in this adhesive that the polymer chemist developed to try to hold our scaffolds in place and perform the procedure called microfracture, where we drill little holes into that defect so we get bleeding coming through that hydrogel that's essentially creating the right environment for tissue to grow. <laughs> so what happened? Um, this is just a little snapshot, but after two years, we see close to 100% fill of defects that had the treatment with that hydrogel biomaterial, creating that nice environment for tissue growth, compared to microfracture alone, where at two years, about 65% of the defect is filled. So that's great that we're able to um, help treat this tissue loss, but one of the big themes in the laboratory has been getting feedback from clinical translation to do new science. So what did this cartilage translation experience tell us? Well, it shows us that life is complicated, right? So these patients come in with a nice big defect, but you can put the most beautiful piece of cartilage in that defect, and if it's not in the right environment in the joint, if you still have inflammation, if you still have problem with the snowball fluid, <coughs> uh, you're gonna have failure, right? So again, we put the polymer chemist on the job, and we also had a very artistic uh, master's student working on the project who um, made this video. So after learning to repair the cartilage defects, we then went to address the challenge of lubrication on the tissue surface. So what we did is we took the um, native tissue and those proteins that are on that cartilage surface and we used synthetic polymers to essentially attach um, a peptide that can grab onto certain components of a synovial fluid. Now that peptide was actually discovered in the cancer literature. And so again, we're taking convergence and borrowing from different fields. So we can stick this peptide on that helps bind that, these green beads, which is the slippery uh, hyaluronic acid that's in the synovial fluid. So we can get back to that low friction, uh, painless movement of the joints and hopefully a happy patient. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done that work in cartilage. And one day, Oliver Shine came to my office. He read about what we did in the cartilage work. And he said, you know, you know, cartilage is okay, but you know, the eye is so much more important, right? So forget about the cartilage, and you need to start looking at uh, some other applications. So we compared the two, and well, there are actually a fair amount of similarities, and the platforms that we use to treat cartilage repair, we can also start applying to the eye. And there are actually a fair amount of similarities between at least some of the tissues. Now, our first project in the eye was funded by the military. It was my very first um, military grant. And the goal was to help treat soldiers who, despite nice uh, gear on their eyes, had significant damage on the outermost part of the eye, which is the cornea. And so this cornea, um, again, like cartilage, once it's damaged, you generally only get scar formation, and it's really tough to uh, regenerate. Actually, there's some similarities between the cells in uh, the way the cells behave in the cornea and also in the cartilage. So again, we put the material scientists on the job, and they made this implant that um, looks clear, it's like a piece of plastic, but it's actually made purely out of collagen, which is all over your body. So your skin is mostly made of collagen. So how do you get the same components that are in your skin to actually be clear like that? We use 
some really nice ways to assemble that collagen so it's all aligned and it has these layers that actually is not too far <coughs> off from the native cornea. Close enough that if I show only this picture to an ophthalmologist here, they'll say, well, that's a piece of cornea. But it's actually something we've made purely, completely in the dish. And we're looking forward to moving that uh, forward in partnership with a company. Now, my second clinical translation project is a little bit unique. So, I apologize to Ned, but I call this our dark side project. And the reason I call it our dark side project is because it's an aesthetic application trying to get rid of wrinkles. And I really didn't think as an academic lab I really wanted to work on that, but it was a really smart team of scientists and really good business people, and I thought, heck, why don't we give it a try? So, you may be familiar with uh, tissue fillers. So it's hyaluronic acid that people inject, um, and you sort of puff out the wrinkle, and, well, it's great business for the dots, because when it goes away, you even need it more. Um, but a little bit Star Trek inspired was that, hey, let's inject this and use light that we um, expose uh, to the overlying skin and solidify it in situ so it doesn't degrade. So we made a whole array of materials that had different properties, some soft, some hard, some slowly degrading, quickly degrading. So, so that, was, um, that was all nice. But one of the challenges when you put any type of foreign implant in the body is you get a response. The first responders are these cells called macrophages, part of your immune, uh, your immune system. And what they do, though, is they secrete stuff around it that start walling it off. Think of a splinter you might get in your finger and how the body walls it off and tries to push it out. And depending on the properties of your biomaterial, uh, that can be a pretty thick capsule and actually block off that implant. So you try to design your material to minimize that foreign body implant. Now one of the neatest things about this project is that we could actually implant materials in people and get them back. So what the company did was they said, we're going to give you a free tummy tuck. But in exchange for that, we get the implants back. So this is a huge opportunity for us to see what the body actually does in response to that material. So here are the implants that were um, exposed to light, and you can see how they're, um, they, they've kept their shape better compared to the implants that were slowly degrading. But we saw two interesting things with this. First, we saw that the location of the implant made a difference in the response. So if the location was next to muscle or fat or uh, skin dermal tissue, you had different responses. So the location impacted the response. And then the second interesting piece was out of peer review. So in academics, we have this great process called peer review. We send our work out to be published and we get comments and critiques from our colleagues around, uh, around the country. And they told us, we want you to stain for this extra cell type. Said, okay, whatever I have to do to get this published. Okay? And we stayed for the cell type, the C4 positive T cell. I didn't really know much about this cell type. And, um, but we saw some positive responses. Right? So there were two interesting questions here the impact of the tissue location and these new cells. So, what do you do when you have a really interesting question about something you really don't know much about? And at the same time, you have a really unhappy eighth grade teenager? You go to Switzerland. <laughs> so I took a sabbatical for a semester, and I went to Switzerland to a, an immunoengineering laboratory to try to learn some immunology, and everybody was happy, and it was a real great time. Now, it's sort of funny, though, how you have to travel all across the world, travel across the world, in order to work with the people next door. So when I came back, I knew some of the language of immunology, but I also knew that I was really far from being an immunologist, and I needed help. So we're very lucky to have next door the Bloomberg Kimmel Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. So this is a picture of a T cell, that same, same cell that I showed you before, attacking a tumor cell. So the folks next door are amazing leaders in this field, and um, it's having a huge impact on late stage cancer. But these same T cells, we can start looking at in the context of regeneration. Now another thing that I thought was interesting about the field of immunology is the language that was used to describe it. So this is an article in a technology magazine um, on, on immunology. And if you look at the language, militia of cells, detect and destroy, defenses, an army of subtypes, elite forces, invaders, fighting off. All very heavy military language, right? So it's all about fighting infections, fighting cancer. But if you think about this, the military actually does a lot more. And these are pictures that aftermath of World War II. It's actually post so 
after the bath is done, whether it be infection or cancer, you have to rebuild, right? And who are these people who come and create the right environment, the right environment to rebuild? It's often these military first responders. So this picture of the Indian military after a landslide, building a bridge. So you have to build a bridge and create the right environment in order for the carpenters, electricians, builders, architects to come and rebuild the city. The same thing applies to our body. In other words, you have a seed, you need to plant it in the right environment, create a fertile environment. It doesn't matter how great that seed is. If it's in uh, a terrible environment, it's not going to grow. Mm -hmm. The same thing applies to regeneration. You got a stem cell, the most perfect stem cell, and if you don't put it in the right environment, it's not going to grow and build tissue. So historically, we focused on building biomaterials to help create that fertile right environment for tissue growth. But now we see the role of the immune system in working with those materials in promoting tissue growth. And we're applying that now to all different parts of the body. So it be muscle, um, uh, muscle defects, cartilage defects, and the eye, and you can apply it to the neural system. It really has potential applications all over. So this is our vision for where the laboratory is going to go, is in the area of regenerative immunotherapies. With the concept that the immune system is the conductor of regeneration and many aspects of biocompatibility. And what's nice is the folks working in the cancer immunotherapy field have a lot of tools in order to manipulate and work with things like T-cells and the immune system uh, to help stimulate repair. So I'm very excited about the next few years and as we start working towards this new goal. Now I promised I'd finish again, or I mentioned Prometheus again. This is a, a mural at the uh, National Academies, and it describes the story of Prometheus. This is Prometheus here giving um, that fire, but describing the fire as uh, knowledge and how Zeus was really punished for giving uh, knowledge um, to the humans. So as the research goes and we get so much information, I particularly like T.S. Eliot's quote, where is the knowledge we have lost in information? and how can we move forward to try to uh, maintain knowledge in the mess of all the information that we have. So um, I, there are many people to thank who uh, helped uh, over the past 15 years and were really critical, and as Peter mentioned, all of the, um, all the great students. And so the lab, I have a few pictures from first postdoc, first master student, first PhD student over the years. And we were actually on the undergraduate campus for 10 years before, before moving here. So it's with great thanks that, uh, uh, to, to the Smith family and Peter for really having a vision to um, look, go into a new avenue. It wasn't really obvious how you bring biomedical engineers into, um, in, into the BI the way that he has done. So here's the lab after moving and continuing to um, relatively stable, um, and now um, being quite active in their um, uh, pursuits. Um, I don't have pictures of everybody, but um, at least um, a, a sampling. And um, these students have gone on to very interesting jobs, um, working at places like the FDA, going to law school to work in patents, going into the business world, working for small companies, large companies, and of course um, a number that have gone on to um, be professors. I'm missing a number of the fellows. I don't have them all, so select them, select them from there. But um, all these people were so critical for this research to move forward. Another important part, um, as Peter mentioned, is the Translational Petition Engineering Center, and um, it's the real part of the group that has um, done a lot to uh, manage all of those students and research and allowing us to essentially create a fertile environment for innovation and research. So I mean Joyce and Bahar, and then the colleagues um, who share the floor with me, um, Jordan Warren, Aitwan, Kevin, and Zandi, I don't have your lab on here, I need a picture of your lab, but um, not only um, great friends, but also great colleagues um, who help us do good science. And of course, um, I, I can't um, neglect the people who fund the work, um, so a combination of Government, nonprofit, and for profit companies have been really cr critical in helping us to move this research forward in addition to collaborators. So, again, Dr. Goldberg, Dr. McDonald, thank you for this wonderful evening. Um, first, I have to thank my family. I have my immediate family here, but also my extended family who's been able to uh, make the trip for this evening. So, thank you for taking the time to come and, and join us this, um, um, this evening.
this evening and it's time to talking to everyone.